It's swim week, so we are gonna get stuck into a specific GTN Coach's Corner Swimming Edition video for you today. I think to be fair, we get a lot of questions around swimming, a majority of them tend to be swimming related. So we're gonna dive into them today, starting with this one from Stenon, saying regarding heart rate, uh, please include swimming heart rate. When humans submerge, our bodies get a diver effect, resulting in even lower heart rate threshold. Would um, I would appreciate if you could explain how one can determine heart rate zones for swimming and how you can use them for training sessions. Very interesting question to start off with and interesting you bring up this diver effect. I'm not, or neither of us are absolute experts in physiology and heart rate. However, from what I understand with diver effect, it's more due to the fact that you are diving deeper down in the water, the increased pressure with that, and that can reduce heart rate amongst other physiological effects. Also, I. T I I understand it's more in relation to people who are doing breath holding, free divers, and therefore they need to lower their heart rate and they work very hard to do that so that they can go further on one breath hold. Yeah. So I'm gonna steer away from the diver effect, but you are very right on the fact that you can have a lower heart rate when swimming. Yeah, so I mean, to start with, you're supported, your body's supported by the water and you're not weight bearing. So that's gonna just mean that you can't get your heart rate as high, but everyone is different within this as well. So you talk about, you know, wanting to know your heart rate zone. So yes, you can work them out. We'll come to that in a moment. So. It will vary. I can't get my heart rate quite as high in the pool as, as swimming, I. which is which is a strange one as well because you think, well, you're using your arms and your legs, so it's more of a full body exercise, but you aren't able to use your leg muscles and those big muscles as much. And something you will also notice when you're swimming is if, say, you're just doing some pool work, you put a pool boy in and you don't use your legs, I can't get my heart rate anywhere near as high. As soon as you add your legs back in, that's where the real effect comes from. But before we kind of come on to how you work out your heart rate, in swimming, especially if you go to you know, swim with swim with swimmers or in a swim squad, heart rate isn't isn't such a, a sort of key factor or a key number to bear in mind because to start with, well, it's not it's not as easy to get an accurate reading. You're either doing it on your watch or heart rate strap, which just don't work as well in water or they don't stay in place. But also when you're swimming along, you can't glance at your watch. Like when you're running, you can see, oh, I'm in this zone or you know, on, on the bike, you can see your heart rate. Swimming, you can only see that at the end. So you're gonna have that delay and also your rest isn't often that long to even check it. So I wouldn't get too caught up on it, but there are ways you can, you can sort of check out your heart rate zones if you want to. Yeah, and obviously there's all sorts of new technology coming through with displaying in the goggles. So yes, it potentially is coming. Well, yeah, sorry, I forgot coming. about that one. Yeah. Well, it, it is coming, but I think, um, yeah, currently it's still quite tricky. Um, what we tend to do in terms of measuring intensity and effort in swimming is using pace and threshold pace. So doing something like a 200 meter and a 400 meter time trial with a short recovery between, and then working out your critical swim speed or your threshold pace. And that tends to be a very good model marker and we are very in tune with that and yeah that's that's probably my suggestion for you but very good question and thanks yeah and you could still do that and actually take your heart rate from that so you know what your heart rate goals would be if you want to really sort of make sure you stay on that but it's yeah up to you. Great stuff. Uh, next one from Shane Thos says they've uh, recently completed their first sprint distance triathlon. Well done. They're looking to do more events. They're looking to work towards a 70.3. Um, they say that they've got a young daughter at home, so they reckon they'll only be able to commit to around 10 hours of training a week. Is that goal realistic? Um, what advice would you give in getting a good base in now over the winter? And would you recommend spending the money on a coach to help me navigate training slash goals? Uh, my swimming needs a lot of work, a lot to uh, pick apart there. Yeah, well, first up, totally 10 hours a week is enough to train for half Ironman. I mean, we've done a video here on actually being able to train for an Ironman with 10 hours a week. So you could just check that out to give you a bit of confidence more than anything. But the winter is such a great time for getting that base. And I would say that if swimming is your weakness, now is the, the winter, especially if you're in the northern hemisphere, is a great time to work on it because you know you're indoors, you're in a pool, and it doesn't matter about it being dark outside. And plus the the working on that and getting your technique now before you add in the mileage is really key. So maybe getting a coach to help just even if it's for a small phase of you know a few a block of sessions to work on that technique which you can then go away and add the rest of your swimming sort of mileage to and then come the spring if you need to save money you can maybe go back to you know not having a coach or getting a coach for all of the disciplines and you can start to piece the puzzle together yeah um, i can't really add too much more to that just more that when you do bring it back in the cycling the running more just trying to build them up gradually as we always talk about um, and just working out with that time available how many 
you can do of each. We normally suggest maybe two of each per week yeah. on that sort of basis with 10 hours of training per week. It's probably worked quite well. Um, but yeah, absolutely possible yeah. in 10 hours. And one thing, if you are moving up in distance, yeah, the swim does increase, which is scary, but not by that much. And the percentage of the swim compared to the bike and the run is less. So that could be something that maybe, you know, it's a positive to take from it as well. I see it as a negative because I love the swim. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, next uh, question from NG Dogs one um, They say, great tip, Mark, about finishing the stroke. They're going to work on that. But then go on to say, um, how can they increase their stroke count? I'm able to hit over two kilometers now, but at a nice, easy pace. Would like to begin increasing my speed and obviously their cadence. I think with that, any help is greatly appreciated. Um, number of ways we can tackle this one so firstly about just increasing general speed um, we've spoken about this before but doing focus sessions focusing on that speed also threshold pace that's going to allow you to do that rather than just aimlessly jumping in and mm -hmm. trying to cover distance um, you can also in terms of just getting that real top end speed and increasing that stroke cadence doing some short sprints off the wall um, just 10 to 15 meters flat out really trying to move the arms quickly um, you can pop a pool boy in as well one of the key things here is actually almost getting that disconnect between the arms and the legs a lot of people end up kind of stuck in a rut with the same cadence as their leg kick you know, we might be doing a four beat leg kick and the arms go at the same rate so trying to move the arms and the legs at a different rate and i used to do a little drill off the wall where i'd literally drag the legs along spin the arms really quickly and then I do another one where I push off the wall kick my legs really hard but move my arms really slowly it's just kind of disconnecting so that you can just accelerate and move the arms yeah. quickly single to. arm is another one that could you know is, is slightly different because you're not relying on the rhythm of the other arm and I find if you're doing single arm you just tend to move it that bit quicker because you don't have the time you know, there's no dead time you've got to get your hand back yeah. around quickly so that's another thing same with water polo drill because it's hard you've got your head up and you just naturally are going to have a higher cadence and it's also quite fun things to add in and spice up your swimming and stop you getting stuck in that kind of slow rut as well yeah definitely uh moving on to the next question connor colivi uh so they started swimming again um, after a number of years away from the pool. After I get out of the pool, I feel very faint and sick. I don't eat too much before swimming, just a quick snack bar for energy about an hour before. Am I just going too hard too early or could it be something else like going from horizontal to vertical position too quickly, for instance? Oh, I mean, there could be quite a few things, but yes, you, we know you're eating just before, but make sure you've had a decent meal long enough before that because it could be a bit of fueling. Hydration is a real key one. If you're dehydrated, you're, gonna, you're more likely to feel faint. You've got less blood volume, so that's going to have more of an effect when you do go to, stand, you know, to standing back up. But I think you're more on the cue for going from horizontal to vertical. However, there's a few other factors. So if the pool's really warm or you've done a really hard session you know you've done all of that in that in that horizontal position and as a result all of your capillaries are going to be dilated so your blood's going to be flowing around but your heart rate will drop when you finish and if you then suddenly go to stand up all that blood isn't going to be being pumped around it's going to sort of sink to your feet so that can make you feel quite faint so just make sure you do a warm down and if that's not enough just sit on the poolside for a moment chat to your friends before you stand up and, and walk away so yeah it's, it's a little bit of an experiment but just make sure you're well fueled and you've, you've cooled down I think is my yeah one, one thing to add to that is a lot of people think because they're surrounded surrounded by water that you tend to feel a little bit more hydrated than yeah. potentially you are and and don't forget you you are sweating when you're in the pool um, so make sure you do hydrate taking mm. on electrolytes I have definitely fallen foul to this as well haven't taken on enough get out of the pool and you feel very faint and lightheaded mm. also maybe I know you're taking a little snack on before but what are you eating in the rest of the day the few hours mm. before have you eaten anything sufficient or sufficient enough earlier in the day because yeah a single snack bar is probably not going to be enough to see you through yeah. a session. So. Um, and one final point actually, and it's more again from a friend's experience that, um, and she just gets it more with open water, that it can sometimes be your ears being affected mm. and it can make you feel dizzy. So earplugs could be something. And then if you tried all of that and you've still got a problem, I would recommend you know, speaking to a doctor or someone who sort of can give you some specialist advice. Yeah, very good question though. Um, next one from Elena. Um, I'm more aware of having a better technique in the pool, but when it, go, but when it goes all over the place when I swim in the ocean, I try to remember and follow it, but it's harder with the chop and the waves. Is there a way to transfer the training from the pool to the open water? <laughs> uh, yeah. you're, you're perfect for uh, this one, Mark. Well, um, it's, it's totally normal. Uh, most people struggle with this, and I think this is probably the big thing when going to the open water is trying to transfer everything that you've learned in the pool to the open water. And quite often people say that 
swimming in the open water is almost like a completely new and different sport. Mm -hmm. In fact, myself coming from a swimming background before triathlon, I jumped in triathlon races and actually I wasn't that fantastic at the swimming, even though on paper I should have been. So it does take some learning and just practice in the chop in the open water and just swimming and really focusing on your technique. A thing to remember in the open water due to this chop, as you've explained, is that the stuff above the water it is going to get disrupted and may have to change slightly due to that but it's the stuff that happens underneath the water that's most important and if you want to kind of find out a little bit more and see what i'm talking about here we have got a video on this called pool stroke versus open water stroke we'll put the link for that in the description down below yeah exactly in the wetsuit can have a bit of an effect as well because you're going to be put in a slightly different position but your shoulders will feel slightly different and your elbows you might if you have a sort of naturally high elbow recovery that might just not be quite the same so don't worry about what it looks like it's what it's what's going on it's like almost um the the opposite to to a swan that looks elegant on top and yeah. just kind of rapidly underneath whereas you want to look good underneath and it doesn't matter what it looks like on top yeah i actually used to do some drills in the open water and in choppy conditions so some of those drills skull drills single arm drills and all that sort of stuff that you would ordinarily do in the pool do them in the open water and just get used to how you can control and and move through the water whilst you're being moved around and bouncing off waves and stuff good one Uh, next we've got jamie furham thanks for the video could you possibly do one discussing different goggle lenses not familiar with the pros and cons of different tints and also any recommendations for a beach start into extremely cold water so the lens one first then. Okay, um, yeah, so the lenses, um, whilst obviously mirrored lenses tend to look really cool and people want to choose them, uh, there is a purpose behind them um, and they're there either to um, uh, deflect light or enhance light. So it really depends on the conditions that you're swimming in. Here in the UK, we quite often are swimming in rather dull conditions uh, due to the weather. Um, So often uh, opting for a lens color that's gonna enhance the light and that tends to be things like the yellowy, orangey, sometimes even the blue lenses, that's just gonna let more light in and enhance it. Um, And then obviously in sunny conditions, you want a mirrored or a smoked or heavily smoked um, lens color. There's all sorts out there and tend to, companies will explain what those um, tints do. Um, uh, With triathlons a lot of them are starting early morning that means that the sun's rising on the horizon so um, I do if I'm abroad I tend to opt for sort of a tinted lens. It can be hard isn't it because you've taken one and then maybe that day it's cloudy. Well that is a really good point going equipped with a couple of sets is really important. Um, As for the other part of a um, open water or beach entry into cold water if you can get in a a warm-up and I say warm-up you know if you can go into the water first and just acclimatize slightly get a little bit inside your wetsuit so that your body isn't going to have that shot get your wrists cold and splash splash your face at the very most if you can't even go if you can't go in for a swim and once you've done that make sure that your core is warm and your heart rate's high so you've done plenty of mobility work so again you know your your muscles are warmed up and ready to go so when you do hit that water yeah it'll feel cold but you'll be able to quickly get over that and, and start moving yeah don't be ashamed to do some press-ups on the side of the um... yeah whatever <laughs> uh, a couple of more questions though fire through these ones um kigo and Kigo and go-go, I think that says. Um, do you sight and then breathe or breathe and then sight? Oh, this is a good one. It it's is, isn't it? Debate. We actually had a quick chat about this beforehand because I don't even know what I do, but you've got the logical explanation. Um, okay, so this is how I would always coach it and teach it. Um, so you, I would suggest sighting then breathing so essentially as you the hand enters and places pressure down on the water that naturally is going to give you lift in the water so you bring your eyes up just your eyes so almost the crocodile eyes and then as this recovering arm comes round, it snaps the head to the side and then you breathe as you ordinarily do so it's not an additional big movement to the stroke if you do it the other way around it kind of ends up being an additional movement and that can end up with your legs sinking and you're losing momentum in your stroke However, do what you're comfortable with. If you have learnt it the other way around, continue as you are, um, but just be mindful. Yeah, and I guess it could if be it's, improved. Yeah, if it's not affecting your stroke, then it's okay. So maybe you know, get someone to, to look at it, and probably when you get tired, that will affect your stroke more. But also, if you're someone who doesn't breathe that many strokes and you've got quite a high stroke rate, then keep it separate because you know you can actually make that movement even smaller. Just do a little bit of sight, and you know, lift your eyes up a tiny bit, put them down, and then take your breath separately, so it can affect your stroke even less. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Play around with it. Yeah. Um, next one and the final one from Firmino Diaz. Um, I see pros with the wetsuit zip on the downside. How does that work? And if you put the wetsuit over your watch, how do you start the activity? 
Yeah, no, we were debating this. I think by the downside, I think, do you mean that it does up from the top to the bottom? Now, even with Orca that we use, they've got wetsuits which do it in different ways. And I was wearing a few different ones on the weekend and had to really think about where's this zip? So the one that does up from the top to the bottom means that when you do come out of the water, you only have to pull from the bottom up and you can actually get it off that one shoulder in one move. Yeah, it's what so they it's tend quite... to call a, a reverse zip. Um, so yeah. yeah, it's the opposite way around from normal. Yeah, so that if you whether you have one or not, but just if you do or you have a couple, if you're lucky, like us, make sure you know which one it is. Because I'm so like, why can't I get my wetsuit undone? And I was going the wrong way. Yeah, so my, my personal preference is the reverse sit, but I've got to say, I mean, there's not really much in it. Yeah. When you're running through to transition, you've got, you've time, got time to do exactly. either or. As Heather says, that reverse zip does have a bit of a bonus to it that you can whip it off. And it's harder for if someone was to catch the yeah. zip and pull it, they can't do because it's the other way around. Not that that's ever really happened. No. for me anyway um, so yeah, yeah good question um, on to the, the watch, watch. Yeah. Um, yeah, what's your experience on this so I um, well, I did multiple triathlons and I was having to restart it and I find that obviously if you're just doing a, a open water swim training then you can have your watch on the outside it's perfectly fine but you won't be able to get your wetsuit off quickly if you're if you're, you're just getting an absolute tangle so really um, you want to just make sure your wetsuit is just over your watch and either trust yourself to be able to if the buttons are obvious enough you can and it's a thin wetsuit you can actually start it through that if there's a beep that helps and you know but I personally like to just have a quick look just peel it back press start and it doesn't matter if it's 30 seconds before the start you know you can edit that afterwards and you know your watch is going and then you can focus on making sure your goggles are on properly um, so yeah I would say that underneath but just peel it back and do the start whenever you need to I've got to say I'm probably not best place for this one because I never wear a watch when I yeah. swim um, and actually my wetsuits because I my odd body shape they often end up quite <laughs> short so my watch is exposed anyway yeah. so I'll just leave it in transition for you and put it on there or whatever yeah. Yeah. Um, super questions though please do keep them coming using the hashtag GTN coaches call me I really enjoyed diving into the swimming ones this week um, That's, that pun's been used twice now I know now. I know <laughs> um, I hope you've enjoyed today's video so please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to give us a subscribe down below